I'm having a great deja vu getting to go after Will Wright because it, I had, I, the first time I really dedicated myself to trying to explain what I was working on well was when I went up on stage right after a, an amazing, great public speaker, and I was just so, I was so like, oh my God, I have to learn how to do that, how he does that. It was so incredible. Um, well, I'm definitely a, the virtual reality guy, right? So uh, I'm going to give you a little AR uh, from that perspective, which, which, which I hope is interesting. It's probably a, a, little, bit, uh, a little bit different. As, as Tish mentioned, High Fidelity is my new, uh, new company, a new thing where we're very much working, uh, again, on virtual reality. So everybody, I, I think everybody that's crazy enough to work on one thing their whole life or work on something really out there usually comes to it from some perspective. Uh, mine, and by the way, it's thanks for having me here. It's great to be in a room where I bet there's a good number of people who can identify all three of those images. It doesn't usually happen. When I was little, I, I did want to be an astronaut, like a lot of kids, and I was, I was technically, I, I, was, I was into science, and so, I mean, it seemed kind of feasible that, that I could be one, uh, and, I, and I thought about it a lot, and uh, made cardboard spaceships and stuff, but then I got into computer programming, and I remember there were, I was thinking about it before this talk, that there were really two, I tell you, there, there were these two pivotal moments for me with computers that, that drove uh, my own interest in virtual reality, and, and, and as Will said, kind of uh, building another world and, and, and maybe escaping into it, or at least going there for some of the time. And it was really two things. One was that beautiful Mandelbrot image. I remember it, I remember it was about 1985, and my friend and I were zooming. You know, you get those programs that would let you zoom in on the Mandelbrot set, and every time you zoomed into one of those little funny twirlies, you know, you'd find some shape or something that you'd never seen before. And, and we were sitting there doing that, like, for an hour, Zooming in, and then at some point, one of us said, "Well, if we zoom the screen like ten times in its in its width and height each time, and we, you know, we did this, I'd done this like twelve times. I did this. I was like, well, let's do the math. Let's do the math. You know, how big is the original screen that we started with, where we now are looking at one little twelve-inch square of that screen? And the answer was the surface of Earth was how big the screen was. And I remember thinking, like." oh, you know, that's a lot of stuff. Like, that's a lot of math, given that so far as I can tell, every one of these little curly cues, I mean, they look like they're kind of in some sort of starfish family or something, but they look somewhat different from each other. And then the second experience was the Wolfram Automata, which is that, th this thing, it, of course, it's not moving, so you can't really see how cool it looks, but it was this little cellular, cellular automata that I programmed as a kid. And, and again, I saw that, that, that things were alive and moving and changing in there, and that computers could do that, that computers could basically like do the laws of physics. And so immediately I was like, I, I mean, I, I don't think immediately, but as I got older and perhaps more pragmatic as well with respect to the space program, I thought uh, that inner space, you know, that, that there is this ability to create space and, and, and evolution and maybe people someday or whatever inside the computer. And, and so for me, that was like, okay, I'm all in with that. And so then I, then I got to build Second Life, and, and that was starting in 2000. And so that was this huge uh, uh, opportunity, you know, to actually build uh, a place where people could come and sort of uh, grab this enormous Lego kit and make anything they wanted to make. This picture is cool for those here who are Second Life fans because it's a Second Life you can never actually see, which pertains somewhat to, I think, the future and what I'm trying to do now. That's Second Life as it looks if you could render it all the way out. You can actually only see Second Life out to about like here <laughs> when you're in it. And so visually it's not as appealing. But of course that, that's what we could do in the back end where we just took all the computers and we rendered all the stuff all the way out to the horizon. That's like 5,000 Second Life simulators. Um, so Second Life's huge, really big. And I think that's really important in terms of thinking about the future and about uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and I guess real reality. Uh, and, and, and an interesting thing about uh, virtual reality in general is uh, it, it's Second Life is still really big. I mean, a lot of people don't follow it as much, but it's, it's actually the same size community that's always been. It's like about a million people generating hundreds of millions of dollars a year in transactions between themselves. So there's something that's trying to happen. There's something that is happening uh, with all this stuff. And, you know, for me, uh, I, I just personally have felt like uh, I, I couldn't, I kind of can't get the idea of the virtual world and where it goes and what it becomes next out of my head ever. I feel like I'll always be working on it. In fact, I feel the way about virtual worlds. You know, when you ask, you know, what, what, what do you think comes next or what do you think the deal is with virtual worlds or whatever, I feel the same way Han Solo felt about money when Princess Leia asked him. Um, it feels to me like the, 
the impact that virtual worlds and their, their, their fusion with the real world, which is a lot of what we're talking about here today, uh, all of this stuff is early. This conference, this, this group, all of us, we're early, but, we're not, but it's not small. It's just really early, and it's an interesting thing. I mean, there's so many hard places to push on. Uh, we did some amazing work on, we, we did some work with Google Glass with high fidelity where we were using it to extract the sensor data, and it's like there's so much promise, and, and at the same time, there's so many challenges, so many, so many use questions, you know, what, what is this stuff going to uh, do? But the thing is that, that, that Moore's law is inexorable. Uh, it, it can only mean that our computers are going to get faster and our server farms larger and our memory larger and, and, and our rendering faster. And what this all in means, unless you're crazy, is that at some point the sort of uh, richness and detail associated with these virtual and these augmented experiences will uh, rival and in, then in many ways surpass the real world. So high fidelity is uh, what I'm working on now, and I, and I think that it does come a lot closer to reality. And I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing, and then uh, uh, not, and we're not really talking about it yet, but I, I can tell you a little bit and, and show you something. Uh, but, but basically, I think that there's two ways in which virtual worlds and especially augmented reality uh, and the technology behind it fundamentally needs to change as a platform to make these things work, and that is speed and scale. That is to say, uh, speed in terms of frames per second and latency and the, 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 sort of, uh, the sort of physical or neurological feel of the experience. And then the other one is just scale, which is the real world, augmented worlds as data sets applied on top of it. These things are big, uh, and they require a lot of servers. And even though we do have a lot of servers out there now, um, they require a lot. Um, trying to think what to do first. Well, let me show you this first. One of the things we've been doing is, so latency, speed. So I am just, I'm really interested, and we're really interested in, at High Fidelity about what different types of delays do to different communication experiences. And this is a timeline, I just made this a couple days ago, zero to 500 milliseconds. So this is a delay from, from when something happens to when you experience it of anywhere from between uh, one and 500 milliseconds. You, you may note in amusement that the, the cell phone, our current you know, frequently used tool for, for voice communication, is actually over on the horrific side of things now. That in San Francisco, at least, the AT&T cell phone networks offers us a stunning uh, 450 milliseconds, almost a half a second between when you speak your voice and the other person on the other end hears it. Incredibly slow. Um, Skype is actually quite a bit better at 275. Um, that's intuitively why I think a lot of us jump on Skype now. It, it's a personal thought that I have. Audio quality is quite good as well. But all these really good emotional experiences that we have are experiences in which the signal delays between us are quite small. So for example, 15 milliseconds is the point at which two uh, professional artists, like mu uh, musicians, are unable to jam together. They're unable to play music together. We actually tested that by inducing delay between not those two guys, but two other guys, my co-founders, who it turns out are professional musicians, um, or were. And then, you know, one is kissing. Uh, sound, sound actually travels at about one foot per millisecond in the air. So the, part of what's great about having a conversation when somebody's standing at a whiteboard talking to you is that they're like 10 milliseconds away from you. So there's not a lot of uh, break in that synchronization. And you can feel that intimacy. It's a real experience. So one of the things we're working on, and I'm going I'm to do the crazy, I'm going to do the big crazy here of actually switching over to a, uh, switching over to my editor here and running something in, in real time. I have no idea. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I have to not move. Wait a second. I've never done this before. We haven't tried this outside of the office. If anybody throws up, I don't know, it, then it's a first. <laughs> but to give you, I can barely hear you, to give you an idea what, 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 what I mean by latency, I'm going to switch to this mode where I can see myself. So look at that. So that, that's an avatar that's following my head motions. Oh, 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 wait. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much, you guys. Wait a minute. i got to slide the screen over. Check that out. OK. Is it up there? Am I up there? I'm kind of up there. I know, let's go to the center of that. That's good. Well, you can see this. So am I looking forward to it? It's funny. I've never done this before. So that's an avatar. That, that's my avatar following my head motion. So you can see basically me nodding and how, how quickly my head moves and how quickly that's happening. That's a delay of about 15 milliseconds between when I'm talking and when you're seeing that head move. And when you do this and you look at yourself sort of in the computer mirror, 
it's a stunning feeling. There, there's a very weird uh, otherworldly feeling to having that low a latency or delay in a circuit. So I just, we're not ready to show all the rest of the crazy stuff that we're working on back there, but I wanted to just take a second and, and show you that. So that's a, that's a fun first uh, public demo of this thing. Does that work? Okay, cool. Um, cool. My team will be happy that that kind of worked. Um, I just thought I'd try putting those things on. And this is a little gadget. These are little, this is a little gyroscope, like what we have in our, uh, like what we all have in our iPhones. It's just pulled out and streaming the data directly to my PC that's then rendering it for us. I also learned a lot about, the other thing that made me start to really think about virtual worlds was Minecraft. Uh, and this idea of subdividing the world into little tiny squares and then being able to do that uh, basically indefinitely, to be able to chop the world up into little pieces. I looked at what people were doing with ideas, with, 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 with Minecraft and with all of its various uh, uh, copycats, and I was just fascinated by how things like that were happening. And so I started thinking about, uh, about this idea of, uh, uh, of cubes and about how the servers and the world itself could be subdivided into smaller and smaller pieces that could maybe have some laws of physics that worked in between them, where may maybe there could be a generic sort of a concept of a physical universe in which it's, it was divided up into those little pieces. And along the lines of scale, as I mentioned before, there's this idea of what would, what would happen if, as you subdivided that world, those little pieces could be tied to, com to different server computers, and not just server computers in a server farm, but the computers on your, in your desktops at home, and maybe even the computers, uh, maybe even your iPads, maybe even your phones when you're asleep at night. What if, what if I could come up with a system that broke up a virtual world into small enough pieces uh, so that, so that uh, you could use basically tens of millions of computers to simulate the virtual world, rather than the tens of thousands of computers that we have simulating virtual worlds today. And so we've been thinking about and doing a lot of work on that. Um, whoops. Uh, let's see, last few thoughts, uh, and then some questions. What, what, you know, one of the, again, one of the things that I think is so fascinating uh, about this idea of, of, of recreating the world or of reimagining the world in a digital form is that most of the time people talk about how, you know, w well, the, the, the quality's not quite as good or the sound's not quite as good or the graphics aren't quite as good. But, but wait a second, uh, if you take, if fundamentally, if you think about a virtual world, what you're going up, what you're putting up against each other here is millions and millions and millions of increasingly powerful computers simulating space where Mother Nature does actually give us a finite upper limit. It's about one hair dryer or about 1,000 watts per square meter of, of Earth. And that's the energy streaming in from the sun is all the energy that we'll ever get. And that energy has to simulate our trees and our animals and us. It has to simulate, so to speak, uh, everything we find on Earth. And, and again, as I said, inexorably, Moore's Law is going to tell us that we are going to um, be able to make the world uh, more and more and more uh, detailed in a digital form in a way that, that meets and then surpasses the real world. So that's just a, an, an incredible thought. Um, as I think about, let me skip ahead, as I, as I, th as I think about how, uh, well, I'm running, I'm running out of time, so let me say, let me look at this one slide, which is, if you imagine, if, if, when I imagine a, a virtual world that uh, becomes increasingly detailed, and, and, and then I imagine a second thought, which is what we're talking about here, which is, I imagine a, a virtual world that is phenomenally uh, detailed and also has the property that you can take uh, a mobile device, a phone, an iPad, and essentially just move it around and use it as a little glass window to look with very low latency into some sort of a digital recreation of maybe the same space. I don't know exactly what experiences are gonna come out of that. Um, I don't think anybody does at this point. I think it's an immense, fascinating green field. But one thing, one thing I am intrigued by is, is this idea of power laws, which says that, app, so what it says is that if somebody builds one version of something that's driven by network effects and competitive dynamics in the internet, a lot of times what you get is one big winner. That's what you saw with Google and search. It's what you saw with eBay. I've got this thought about augmented reality, which is we're going to build another version of Earth, right? I mean, it's just too tempting. I mean, why not? I mean, of course, you could play games. You can do all these other things. But why not build a version of Earth that looks exactly like the place you're in right now? And then why not let people compete say, to compete in the economic uh, battle to decide what is there. 
When you look through that little glass window of your device and you look on the wall in here, what do you see? An advertisement, a note from Will? Uh, 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 I mean, what, what, what do you see in that world? Um, and I think the, the fascinating th thought in my mind is, I have no idea what's up on those walls when you're moving those devices around. But what I do know is that, or what I strongly suspect, is that if there's an immense amount of economic competition and a very, very open-ended set of possibilities around what that content will be, there's going to be one sort of dominant version of this alternate or mirror world that we look into with these devices. And that, I think, is the one thing that when I think about what we're building as, a, as just a sort of a generic platform for next generation virtual reality, as I, in my mind, apply it to this, that's one thing that fascinates me, is what, what will that first, first winner in the power law copy of Earth look like, you know? Will it, will it be a kind of a Williamsburg? Will it be the world as we, uh, or like the Amish class, incredibly, incredibly great. Like, will it be a world which is a, a simplified version, of, a version from a different uh, point in time? Just absolutely a fascinating question. So um, I look forward to exploring all of this. I don't, I, I really think that the future of AR and of VR uh, is, is just, you know, both infinite in its ultimate scale and as yet relatively, I mean, almost completely unexplored. So uh, with that, and uh, let me stop and uh, take some questions. Thank you, Philip. So Brady will set up. Do we have any questions? Ah. Do you, you can use the mic or shout if you've got a... Sh okay. That what? The graph that shows the from zero to yeah. Running yeah. Well, digital TVs are typically running at either 60 frames per second, or some of them are trying to shoot for 120 now for some of the local stuff. Although the broadcast content is made at 60 or, or uh, historically at 30 frames per second. 60 frames per second is 16 milliseconds between frames, and it's it's actually right down in that musicians being able to play together stage. Some of the predictive stuff that video games do, they're kind of able to cheat because in a video game you can often do something like, like predict where a bullet is going and then correct for the network delay and things like that between two people. That's pretty specialized to the type of interaction that you're trying to mediate between two individuals. Uh, in a generic physics sense, you're kind of ultimately, I think, up against Mother Nature where you just have to have relatively low latency between two endpoints. But if you think about a 16 millisecond, uh, if you think about a typical home network connection today, you are 12 milliseconds away from a big metropolitan peering point, which means you're another 12 milliseconds away from somebody else, uh, say, say within the same you know, few million people of radius, basically, a big city. And then you are, if you slice up time to be 60 frames per second, what you, what you conclude is that we ought to be able to build a virtual world, a, a gaming experience, an interaction experience with computers that is like six times better than a cell phone and is basically good enough, I, I didn't mention this, but the magic range is 50 to 100 milliseconds. That's where everything's good enough to where for almost all face-to-face -face type human interactions, we cannot detect delay. We can't detect between 50 and 100 milliseconds of delay in our communication. We can take one more question, but Brady is set up, so it should be fairly brief. Well, when we, get in the, when we get the latency between us, first of all, we got to solve this face-to-face -face communication problem. That's why I was showing you the gyros. Like, we, we want to capture enough data from us to make the connection between two individuals work. That, I think, is mainly latency and then sensors. Once you've done that, though, then the backdrop, the context that the virtual world gives you, that was the point I was making, was that with millions of computers, not even a rainforest can, can hold off what we can do. And if you look at movies today, if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the jungles or the, the, like, think of Avatar, the big landscapes of tomorrow, they're all rendered at this point. We don't shoot that on, we don't shoot that with film cameras anymore because the real world is no longer spectacular enough for us. We are now reliant or perhaps uh, addicted in some sense to uh, virtual worlds because they simply offer a higher level of detail and five years from now that detail will run on our mobile devices 
uh, in real time, where today it runs, you know, in, in non-real time on the machines making the movies. So, so that's. I think the whole kit and caboodle is going to be amazing. I, I, I think we're ultimately going to offer experientially better uh, moments than, than we can have on Earth. Yeah, um, I'm all in on that. Thank you, Philip. Um, and welcome.